I'm going to uh, finish off black holes. Uh, we won't get to the Kerr metric. And um, we'll just finish with Schwarzschild. And, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about cosmology. So just to recap, we studied light rays uh, going, into, um, uh, going into a black hole in uh, Schwarzschild coordinates. And uh, we found that these ingoing uh, light rays sort of diverged off to t equals infinity and uh, did this. Um, um, and uh, this created some puzzles because um, <coughs> Inward going radius was future going time for such uh, light rays. But then we considered light rays which were um, uh, which would be future pointing light rays, but of the other type. Uh, okay, they're two, they're obviously, uh, two independent. Um, uh, coordinates, and unfortunately, these guys were going backwards in time uh, um, outside uh, the black hole. And so there's a, there's a sort of uh, inconsistency in this picture. So And I pointed at the resolution, which is to introduce new patches of space-time, where um, there will turn out to be two copies of the interior and two copies of the exterior. Um, and we're going to see this now. So we're going to put this all together. By defining... Uh, uh, u to be t minus r minus rs log r over rs minus 1, and v to be t plus r um, plus rs log r over rs minus 1. And so u is um, constant for outgoing Uh, null rays, and V is constant for ingoing null rays. And then, uh, so the person who did this was Kruskal, <coughs> Martin Kruskal. He later be became famous in uh, integrability, theory of integrable systems. And so it's physical review uh, 119, 1743 in 1960. And so Kruskal said, OK, well, these are good coordinates. So let me change the whole metric to these coordinates. And so we have uh, dv, sorry, we have uh, du equals dt minus dr um, over 1 minus rs over r, and dv equals dt plus dr 1 minus rs over r. OK, just by differentiating the log. And so the line element is equal to minus 1 minus rs over r du dv plus r squared d omega squared. OK, so it doesn't look so different. 
than it did in the um, ingoing or the outgoing coordinates. It has no du squared term. It has no dv squared term. It has only the off-diagonal term uh, here and here. Um, and uh, so zero on the diagonal in the sort of T and R entries or U and V entries. It only has the GUV. Um, and R, so this is a funny formula because it involves R. Of course, U and V are the coordinates, so we have to express R in terms of U and V. R is defined by um, R plus RS log R over RS minus 1 equals V minus U over 2, right? If I take V minus U over 2, I get 2R from here, and I get twice, <coughs> twice the log. So divide by 2, and I get this formula, i.e., uh, R over RS minus 1 multiplied by E to the R over RS is equal to E to the V minus U over 2RS. Okay, so this is, uh, this is um, right-hand side is some function of U and V. The left-hand side defines R. Now, clearly, this is only valid, valid for R bigger than Rs, okay? As were the original formulae. I mean, this, uh, the log would have an imaginary piece if R was less than Rs. So basically what we're doing is we're sitting outside the black hole, and we're changing coordinates to some new coordinates. And the coordinate transformation is completely valid here. Nothing wrong with it, but the coordinate transformation is fishy at r equals rs. And as I, as I explained, we need to do something fishy to remove the badness in the coordinates. Okay, so uh, we're doing this outside rs. We're going to go to these new coordinates, and then miraculously we'll discover that in the new coordinates, nothing, there is nothing wrong at all at r equals rs. Okay, so... Uh, if you graph this, okay, in fact, you'll see the left-hand side. If I graph this function as a function of r over rs, obviously at large r, it grows exponentially, right, like r e to the r. At r equals 1, it's 0. And at r, uh, r over rs equals 1, it's 0. And, and r smaller than rs, it's negative. Okay, so the left-hand side is negative for R less than Rs. This side is always positive. So this doesn't really uh, make sense for R less than Rs. But, you know, no worries. We're just cha changing coordinates uh, outside the black hole. Um, fine. So this is our metric, okay, in these new coordinates, where... R is defined. So this defines R. Oops. This defines R of U and V. Um, okay, so uh, now I want to re-express this. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to simplify this metric. So what I'm going to do is um, use this formula to calculate that factor. All right, so let's call it star. Okay, so star implies, so if I just take star and multiply it by rs over r, what I get is that 1 minus rs over r is equal to e to the minus r over rs times e to the minus v over e minus u over 2. Okay, so it follows 
that ds squared is equal to minus rs over r. Um, oh, did I? Uh, sorry, there's a rs over r here. rs over r minus rs over r times um, e to the minus r over rs times e to the v minus u over 2 rs du dv plus r squared d omega squared. Okay, so that factor multiplying the du dv is completely positive now. Okay. Um, you can sort of see what we're trying to do, <laughs> which is avoid sign changes in this term. Okay, so we've manipulated around so that that factor just doesn't change sign as I go across Rs. Uh, in this form, it obviously does change sign. Okay, then I did this coordinate transformation to this form where it's not going to change sign. Okay, uh, the, as I've emphasized, the coordinate transformation only uh, makes sense if R is bigger than Rs. And now we do the really tricky part, which is we set set capital U equal to Rs e to the minus little u over 2 Rs, and capital V equals to Rs um, e to the V over 2 Rs. And why is this tricky? Because the right-hand side is totally positive. The left-hand side, I'm going to extrapolate to negative capital U and capital V. Okay, and so what what happens is that d s squared. So this is po these are positive, but these we're going to extrapolate <coughs> to negative values. Okay, and actually what we're doing here is analytic continuation. Okay, we're really um, using the fact that in the right set of coordinates, the metric is analytic, and there is a unique analytic uh, extension. Analytic in the complex number sense. There's a unique analytic extension of the metric to negative values. Now, there is a unique analytic extension Um, okay, so we have u and v. Then the s squared becomes 4 rs over r. Uh, you see the du is just going to give me a minus du over 2, and the dv will give me plus dv over 2 uh, times this factor. Uh, so here we have e to the minus r over rs. Um, du dv plus r squared d omega squared. And now, finally, we're going to set u equal to x minus t and v equals to x plus t. And so ds squared is equal to 4 rs over r e to the minus r over rs. This factor is singular, but only at the center of the black hole, r equals zero. We know that's a real singularity. It's positive everywhere else, minus dt squared plus dx squared. This looks like Minkowski space, plus r squared d omega squared, where... x squared minus t squared is equal to uv is equal to rs squared e to the v minus u over 2 rs uh, is equal to rs squared 
e to the r over r s times r over r s minus 1. This equation defines r. r. Okay, so I have this metric, and r is really a function of t and x. And that function is defined by this equation. Um, and so you'll see in this equation that the you see in this equation the left hand side and the right hand side can both be positive and negative and therefore we're going to fill out the most of the xt plane okay most actually not all the xt plane but most of it and similarly and uh, t is u plus v over 2 equals rs log v over u equals rs log x plus t over x minus t defines, well, we don't, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't need t for the metric. Metric doesn't depend on little t. But that's just uh, a relationship between our old original short shell time coordinate and, the, and, and this new coordinate. Uh, and I'll just put in brackets here. We'll need to correct this slightly momentarily. Doesn't really mat matter for the metric, but uh, you can see the problem, which is that when x minus t goes negative, well, when either the numerator or the denominator go negative, that log is going to have an imaginary part, and we'll see we'll have to, um, we'll have to correct that. Um, so, um, so that is the that is the metric in in Kruskal coordinates. Okay, where uh, where this equation defines R, and uh, amusingly, this formula is wrong in Bob Wald's book. <laughs> which is one of the famous textbooks on GR, but if you look at this carefully, it's not right. Um, but um, it's a great, uh, Wald's book is a good book, but it's very formal, and um, yeah, not, not quite right in some things. Um, So, let's try and understand what this means. Uh, first of all, if we look at this equation for R, um, as I mentioned, so that uh, the two key points, one, um, what happened to the singularity uh, at r equals zero. Okay, so there's a singular a singular at r equals zero. Now, so obviously the metric is singular when r is zero, but we're using these x and t coordinates. So what is the locus of the singularity in the x t coordinates? Well, I just come to this equation and put r equals zero. So this factor is one, and this factor is minus one. So this means i e at um, on the locus, a locus is like a, a line of uh, a line in in the xt plane. On the locus, um, t squared minus x squared equals r s squared. Okay, because x squared minus t squared is minus r s squared, so I've just rewritten it this way. Uh, that's a hyperbola. Okay, in the t x plane. So the singularity, which used to be at a point, 
is now a line in these xt coordinates. I e I hyperbola. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the solution only uh, is only valid, so it's singular, and it's only valid for r bigger than zero, um, i.e. t squared minus x squared. Um, so this function here is, um, uh, let me see, is always bigger than minus r s squared for uh, for r bigger than zero. So this is t squared minus x squared is less than r s squared. Okay, so there's basically an upper bound on this. Um, uh, yeah, there's an upper bound on this quantity. So at x equals zero, t, the capital T, is going to have a limit. And basically, that's when you hit the singularity uh, at some value of t. Um, the second key point, yeah, is there a question? Is there a question? No questions? Okay, second key point. Uh, t doesn't seem to make sense. T only makes sense for r less than r s if we uh, define it via dt equals, oh, sorry, via t equals, and then we put a absolute value in this in the log x plus t over x minus t. Okay, then at least t is real for all values of, all allowed values of x and t. As I said, little t doesn't enter in the metric, so it doesn't really matter. This is just trying to relate capital and x and, and little and capital T to little t, the original Schwarzschild coordinates. Okay, so now let's make a picture of this uh, metric, of this space-time, I should say. And it's called the max maximal extension uh, Kruskal uh, picture of a black hole, also known as the maximal extension of Schwarzschild. So um, we're going to be using capital T and capital X as our coordinates. So here's capital T, and that's uh, capital X. And so the first thing we should plot, <clears throat> well, you can see what radial light rays do in uh, these coordinates, right? Because radial light rays have this term is 0. And so for radial light, light rays, um, x is plus or minus t, right? ds squared is 0 if dx is plus or minus dt. So a nice feature of these cross coordinates is that radial light rays move in straight lines at uh, 45 degrees. So we can draw, draw those right away. Okay, so this is... Uh, let's draw the light rays through x and t equals 0. Okay, so this line is obviously t equals x, and this one, or maybe I'll write it as, uh, what have I called these arguments? x and t, yeah, so x equals t, and x equals minus t, or t equals minus x. Um, uh, 
And uh, so, yeah, let's begin by figuring out where r equals rs is. So at r equals rs, well, that, that, those are the two lines that I drew, right? r equals rs is x equals plus or minus t. So we can just write down here r equals rs. This is r equals rs. So right away you see there are two versions of rs. Radius equals rs, not, uh, not one. Um, secondly, let's figure out where the singularity is. So the singularity is... Uh, is along that curve. That's a hyperbola. There are two hyperbola. There are two copies of, there are two parts of it. One of them is up here. Okay, so let's do that in a different color. This is a singularity. There's another part, uh, another branch of the hyperbola down here. Okay. And uh, this part of the space-time doesn't, that's r less than zero. Okay, so this is r equals zero. This is r equals zero. This is the singularity. So we don't know how to go beyond there using gr. Um, it's uh, interesting to ask, what about t, this little t? Obviously, this little t, if um, x tends to, um, if x is greater, capital X is greater than capital T and, uh, and positive, and x tends to capital T, you see, the argument of the log is going to go to infinity, so little t will go to infinity, right? As you approach this line, t, so this line is actually t equals infinity, plus infinity. And conversely, if capital X goes to minus t, capital T, then the numerator goes to zero, so the log goes to minus infinity, so this line is uh, t equals minus infinity, r equals rs, and, um, and the same here. This is t equals plus infinity, r equals rs, t equals minus infinity. And now we're beginning to see the funny things about going backwards in time, okay? Because the t-coordinate uh, advances this way on this half of the space-time and it advances that way on this part of the space-time. Um, and hopefully now, everything should be absolutely clear, because when we send in an ingoing null ray, it just goes at 45 degrees in these coordinates, and so it just goes um, into the black hole and hits a singularity. Okay, but uh, there was another copy of it, which is, uh, which is still ingoing, which comes out of this singularity, okay, and goes off that way. So those were our two different versions of the ingoing null GD6. And likewise, the outgoing ones uh, have exactly the opposite. There's an outgoing one which comes from the singularity and goes out. And there's, um, there's an outgoing one which comes at, from infinity in this part of the space-time and uh, falls in and hits the singularity there. So those are our two copies of the ingoing and outgoing uh, null rays. And they were telling us that, yes, there really are two exteriors of the black hole. This is an infinite universe out here. Right? And there's another infinite universe out here. Um, now, you can immediately see this universe cannot communicate with that universe at all, right? Because this universe um, can only send uh, signals either into the black hole or out to infinity. I mean, if I'm sitting here in this universe 
and I try to communicate with that universe, the best I can do is to send a light ray like this, but it's just going to fall in the black hole. Okay, so it's impossible. Uh, these two universes do not communicate. Um, nevertheless, it's pretty bothersome, this, because, you see, if this picture was really valid, you would say, when we sit out here, a long way from the black hole, when we look back, we can see the singularity of the black hole. Now, we, we have no clue what the right physics is at the singularity. The theory just falls apart there. And so, basically, we wouldn't be able to predict uh, anything. But... Uh, but this is not what happens in the real universe. In the real universe, this singularity is masked from us by the following fact, that, um, that uh, when you have a collapsing star, so as far as we know, black holes form from collapsing stars, and when you have a collapsing star, it's, um, if you think about its surface, the Schwarzschild metric is only valid outside that surface, right? Inside the surface, you've got to take into account the matter. So anything that happens inside the star at smaller radii is going to be affected by the stress energy, so our calculation doesn't apply. I mean, you have to do another calculation. And when, when you do, what you discover is that inside the star, it's not Schwarzschild, it's perfectly regular, okay? So this is a collapse, surface of a collapsing star. Okay, so the idea is I'm going to give you some regular initial conditions, just some uh, space with a star in the middle of it, but there's no singularities anywhere. And uh, inside the star, there, there's none of this stuff. There's no singularity. Nevertheless, the Schwarzschild metric is valid outside the star. When you follow the star collapse, the surface of the star has particles, and they are massive particles, and they have to follow a time-like um, trajectory. In fact, they have to follow a geodesic, because just imagine an atom on the surface of the star, which is very weakly um, uh, coupled to, to everything else. It's falling in under gravity. Um, and so certainly this is a reasonable possibility, is that the particles on the surface of the star, the only thing which would stop it would be pressure, which would hold them out even more. So the, the, the most they will do is fall in as if they were geodesics or, um, in a short space spacetime. So these guys will fall in and hit the singularity. Okay. There's nothing they can do, because once they're across this horizon, they cannot, the, the, they have to move within the light cone. Okay, their time-like uh, geodesics have to go less than the speed of light. And uh, so there's no way they can avoid hitting the singularity. So what it means is that in a realistic collapsing star, uh, the picture is as follows. You, you have to use another metric inside it. You can use the Schwarzschild metric outside it. And uh, particles that uh, fall in on the surface of the star would hit the singularity. But notice that there's a lot of the singularity outside the star. And so, um, and you can use pure GR without uh, stress energy in that region. So this part of the space-time is, is really there. I mean, it's really valid. If a star falls inside its horizon, it's a short child radius, uh, 2 gm over c squared. So if its outer radius becomes smaller than 2 gm over c squared, uh, you'll get a diagram like this. And as you track the space-time inside that short child radius, you're going to find that outside the star, there's a singularity, exactly the one we've described in the short shell metric. It is space-like. Notice the singularity is space-like. As I said, it's not a point. It's actually a surface. 
Okay, and uh, so any particle which which falls in, you know, at, just outside the star is going to hit that singularity. Um, and uh, so there's, you know, huge. Uh, well, it's just true that any ingoing. Um, I can I can extrapolate this picture off to infinity, right? So this diagram goes off to infinity. The singularity goes off to infinity. So imagine the star has collapsed and I'm sitting way out here, but I'm gently, I'm just following a geodesic, right? That means that I put a particle here, there's a black hole over in the Andromeda galaxy, <laughs> and I put this particle here, uh, eventually it's just going to fall in radially, and what that means is it's going to hit the singularity. So this uh, black hole in an asymptotically flat space, right, if we really, this is asymptotically flat, it's, it, it goes to Minkowski space. Black hole in asymptotically flat space will um, suck everything into it. Okay, are there any uh, questions about that? Yeah. I don't know if this is a silly question, but if we take these coordinates of space value, you say there's two copies of space time. Space time. Yeah. Which, you know, as far as the stuff in them, you know, as far as their overall geometry are the same, but as far as the stuff in them might be totally different. And you said they can't they can't communicate, but that's only true outside of the quirk. Right? So like if, I, if I were to yeah, um, fall into a black hole on some kind of suicide mission, yes, I would you all of a sudden be, Interacting with you know for the tenth to the minus five seconds or whatever I've got. I mean, that's I'm correct. Gonna... That's absolutely. It's a good good point. So I fall into the black hole and I can see the other universe, <laughs> right? So you will have uh, ten seconds <laughs> of that, total enlightenment. Crazy, right? Total enlightenment. Okay, <laughs> you fall in the black hole and ooh, <laughs> there's a whole universe out there. Okay. Crunch. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's correct. So, um, yeah, an ast astronaut falling in. Um, How seriously do people take that? Well, it's interesting. Okay, so people study this in great detail. Um, when I was about, about 20 years ago, I went to a conference, and I was talking about some cosmic strings and... Uh, because I was one of the pioneers of exploring, you know, consequences of grand unified theories and things like cosmic strings. And I gave a talk about this, and I was very clear, these are very speculative ideas, we'd love to test them, prove the theories wrong, you know, and uh, this was great fun. But uh, Chandrasekhar was in the audience, so he was... He, Chandrasekhar was probably the sort of most powerful math you know, GR math, math person, partial derivative uh, expert uh, of, the, uh, of the 20th century. And Chandrasekhar just did these horrendously complicated calculations that nobody could even else could even attempt. And he uh, discovered the Chandrasekhar limit um, on, the, uh, on the mass of a compact star, which is a degenerate Fermi gas. But he did millions of other things, and he understood the Kerr metric and studied in huge detail. His books are almost unreadable because the equations just go on for pages and pages and pages and pages, okay? And didn't bother him at all that an equation would include, you know, 200 terms. It was just uh, fine. Uh, so, very brave guy. But he said to me, why are you thinking about all these speculative ideas? We have a theory. We know it's right. Even if it is, even if these space times don't exist in nature, they are right. <laughs> okay, and uh, and it's much more interesting. So he spent the later part of his life actually just exploring weird space times in GR, and he said, "Look, they exist. I don't, I don't care about nature. <laughs> this is the correct theory." And, um, you know, these things exist. So it's a funny point of view. I, I, I never understood it, but uh, I kind of understood what he meant. So you, you feel that by working on it, you're working on something lasting, right? Even if it doesn't exist in nature. And there's, there's a fundamental paradox. I mean, the usual picture 
is that what came out of the Big Bang had no black holes. Okay, for some reason we don't understand. It was smooth. Okay, and there really is no fundamental understanding of that at all. Certainly not from inflation, despite claims. Um, that people just base, assume there were no black holes at the Big Bang. Um, and uh, then all the black holes form subsequently by collapsing stars. Okay, um, so that's the scenario, but it's very strange because there is this possibility of these other solutions which don't exist, just more or less by fiat because we didn't allow them in the initial conditions of the universe. Um, so that's a, I, I think that's a sign that we're missing something uh, very important. I mean, the theory should exclude those solutions. And um, we don't really have good arguments for doing that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, this is more of a question of your opinion on this. How do you think you gave Penrose this voucher to hypothesis and explain exactly that? Yeah, that was one of the motivations. So, Penrose um, made a conjecture that um, initial singularities. Okay, should have the vial tensor uh, going to zero as you approach the singularity. So he wanted to literally put in an arrow of time into GR, which would just exclude this kind of singularity by hand. So he wants to exclude this guy because at this singularity, the Riemann tensor diverges, the vial tensor diverges. Um, uh, but we could exclude it uh, with that uh, condition. So this is the vial curvature hypothesis. Yeah. Um, I just want to clarify the state of the universe. Mm. Sort of the line. Uh, with the blue line? Yeah. Okay. The surface of the star. So what I'm trying, to, what I'm saying is that imagine I've got a star which is collapsing. Inside the star, none of my arguments are valid. I need to resolve Einstein's equations with matter, which you can do. You can do it. It's messy. It's complicated. That's what Oppenheimer did. Okay. Sorry? Oh, uh, the Schwarzschild radius is this line, right? So basically, the star is shrinking in radius, and if it crosses its Schwarzschild radius. So the Schwarzschild radius is just given by 2gm over c squared. So imagine the, the star is collapsing, but its exterior radius is bigger than this number, okay, because it's not very dense. As it collapses, the mass remains the same. So it's collapsing with the same mass, but the radius is shrinking. And when the radius falls below Rs, that is the moment the star crosses its short shell radius. Okay? Now, as I said, the, all this stuff, the, the metric inside here shouldn't believe because it's all, it's smoothed out by the presence of matter in the star. I mean, you just solve different equations and there's no singularity inside the star. However, if I follow a, a particle just outside the star, it really has to evolve in the short shell metric. I mean, it's a unique metric with spherical symmetry. So a particle just outside the star is going to fall in. It's going to cross the Schwarzschild radius and going to hit the singularity. There's nothing matter can do to stop that happening. So it's a very, it's a fundamental breakdown in our picture of space-time. So are you saying that we can totally develop solutions to the Einstein equation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is, this is what Oppenheimer and Volkov did. Uh, Oppen, Oppenheimer did this just before he became director of the, the Manhattan Project. <laughs> okay. Is there a reference for this? What? Is there a reference for this? Oppenheimer, Volkov? Sure. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's very standard. In fact, if you look in the little blue book, it's, uh, it's all in there. Um, did I bring it? I'll tell you where it is. Yeah, it's in, um, 
they, they, they begin this. I'm not sure. Interior solution, yeah. So if you look in chapter 21, it's called Interior Solutions. And the sec third section is the Oppenheimer-Volkoff equation. And it basically tells you if you have some... Uh, so this interior is Oppenheimer-Volkoff. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Does the parallel universe still exist when, the, when you have a collapsing star? No. It's not part of the solution. Either. Well, no, because in this uh, solution, uh, let me see how it goes. You see, um, uh, the meaning of R, this radial coordinate, is uh, in this picture is all to do with the Schwarzschild solution, right? But when I do Oppenheimer-Volkoff, you know, R will go to zero here. I have the surface of a star, and when I extrapolate the solution, you know, I'll go to R equals zero, and everything will be regular. So basically, this line gets replaced by radius zero, but there's no extension, there's no singularity, there's nothing. Okay, but nevertheless, it is true that this part of the space-time, there's nothing you can do to change that. You're stuck with it. Well, you see, no, it, it is true, but only if this d omega is zero, right? So throughout, we've only considered radial trajectories. Okay, so if there's a black hole sitting there, I can easily avoid it just by having a bit of angular momentum. But if I have no angular momentum, what can I do but fall in? So that's why if I have a black hole sitting there and I have a particle long way away, static, so it has no angular momentum, eventually it's going to fall into the black hole and fall through the horizon. So this black hole does affect things all the way to infinity. I mean, because they will ultimately fall in and they hit the singularity. But only if they have no angular momentum. Yeah. OK, so yeah, this is a great hypothesis, but it's totally ad hoc. <laughs> uh, it's just saying it's something we don't like in the theory, so let's assume it's not there. I don't think it's very satisfactory. Uh, it's distinguishing the future from the past. I mean, why? Uh, no explanation. So, um, but uh, what, what is interesting, I mean, a, as you probably know, uh, I developed a cyclic uh, model of the universe. And the cyclic model of the universe attempts to explain what happened before space-like singularities. And there are very strong connections with this hypothesis, that basically there's, a, there's an attractor mechanism which takes the universe towards a zero vial tensor uh, in that scenario. So it's, a, it's more of a dynamical ex explanation. Um, great. So uh, let me just briefly mention what people's uh, viewpoints are currently about that singularity. So current ideas. Uh, maybe let me just emphasize. You cannot avoid the singularity um, uh, through the effect of T mu nu. Outside a collapsing star, which falls through its Schwarzschild radius. And this implies there really is a catastrophe for GR.
uh, GR cannot be the final theory of gravity. And Einstein realized that. Um, you've got to go beyond it. Many, many examples in physics where there's a really good theory, but it breaks down at some level. And a simple example is fluid dynamics, where you have the Navier-Stokes equations. And engineers use these to describe um, aerodynamics or motion of ships through water or whatever. I mean, these are wonderful equations, but if you make a shock, the equations break down. The density, the, the basic assumption of the Navier-Stokes equation is the density is a smooth function of, uh, of the spatial coordinates. But what happens as a shock is that in, instead the density changes like that discontinuously, and this shock moves at some uh, speed uh, velocity bigger than the speed of sound. And, uh, you know, that's what happens when an airplane goes faster than Mach 1. You get a shock wave, and Navier-Stokes breaks down. And what you need is a microscopic theory of air. I mean, there's nothing wrong physically. It's just that air is made out of atoms and molecules. And you need to describe the shock in terms of those elementary constituents. And so... All this is is another indication that GR is an incomplete theory, and you need a microscopic theory of the degrees of freedom in GR. There were ideas that um, string theory would be that solution. Um, string theory sort of is, people hope, because the deg degrees of freedom are delocalized. They're not pa point particles, but they're extended strings. Uh, that seems to help. There are indications that string theory is better at dealing with singularities. There are newer ideas of entanglement, that space-time is not... Um, space-time is only a classical notion, and that uh, space-time is related to quantum entanglement of many-body systems. And I think those are very exciting ideas, that there may be a more elementary description of space-time than uh, there is in GR. This sounds a good idea because the Big Bang is precisely the point where all of space disappears. <laughs> okay? uh, that doesn't make any sense at all in GR. The metric becomes completely degenerate um, and singular, and, and the Riemann curvature is infinity, and everything goes wrong. But if you, have, if you had a theory in which the elementary degrees of freedom were not the metric, but were some unitary quantum uh, spin system, for example, um, and especially if it was a conformally invariant system, then it wouldn't care about the size of uh, space-time, and it would be equally valid at the singularity. So that's my belief, is that that's what we're looking for. We're looking for some description of gravity which goes beyond the metric and replaces the metric with some elementary quantum degrees of freedom, and uh, hopefully that will resolve these problems. We're going to do cosmology in half an hour. <laughs> it's going to be tough, but I'll try. Um, you see, the great thing about cosmology, we, we're outside black holes, right? So this surface of the black hole is called a horizon, I should have said that. Okay, this is a horizon. Okay, the definition of a horizon, it's some surface in space-time, which if I go within it, I cannot communicate with somebody outside of it. Okay, so here's the surface, and if I'm sitting in here, I can't communicate. Now, there's no signpost, you see, at the horizon. <laughs> if I'm an astronomer and I fall through the horizon, I won't see anything happen at all. The Riemann curvature is small. I'm just falling in. No signpost at all. But signals I send will never make it to infinity if I'm across the horizon. So the horizon is a, glo is a property of the global space-time. You need to know what's going on at infinity in order to say whether you can or can't communicate with it. So um, we are outside black hole horizons. There's a black hole in the middle of our galaxy. It now seems that almost every galaxy has a black hole in the middle of it. 
and the many other black holes orbiting galaxies as well. So the universe is full of black holes. Deep, deep paradox for physics, because they've all got this singularity. We have no idea what happens there. <laughs> okay, But um, we're outside the horizon. The strange thing is the discovery of dark energy, okay, the cosmological constant, creates another horizon. It's a horizon beyond which we can't see. We are inside that horizon. Okay? So we're outside the black hole horizons, inside the other horizons. And in a way, just that fact tells you there's a danger of a multiverse. Okay, because in the standard cosmology, there's stuff beyond this dark energy horizon, which we will never see. Okay, because the universe has begun to accelerate its expansion, and we're never going to see the rest of the universe. Wait, wait till eternity. You will never see it. But what's it doing there in the theory? Why is it there? Is it there? <laughs> Certainly this cannot be a quantum theory, because in a quantum theory, all states, more or less the definition of a unitary quantum theory is that all states are, are um, all states are involved in the evolution. You cannot separate off some sets of states in a quantum theory and have them do their own thing and not communicate with the other states. Because quantum tunneling forces all, allows all states to communicate with each other. So, just this fact alone means that there's something wrong, in my opinion, with the GR on large scales as well as on small scales. And it's rather similar to the problem on small scales. And uh, I think a good theory of the universe is going to uh, explain that what's beyond our horizon, the one we are inside of, okay, the horizon of the universe, what's beyond that um, is really space-time foam. It's quantum space-time foam. It's not a real universe. Okay, so this is a very radical opinion, I warn you, but uh, I'm sure it is correct. <laughs> <laughs> so, Okay, so now we're going to do cosmology. Only quickly. <laughs> um, if you are keen, uh, I might give you some more lectures on cosmology later in the year. I can't possibly do justice to it because cosmology is the biggest subject in physics because it includes everything else in physics. Yes. What do you mean by normal matter black hole? Well, I, maybe I was wrong, but I thought you were just saying that we were in the horizon of a dark matter yes. black hole. Yes. So well, it's not a black hole. It's de Sitter space. So de Sitter space is a solution of the Einstein equations with vacuum energy. And it's an exponentially expanding solution. And in that solution, if somebody sends a light ray towards you from sufficiently far away, it will never reach you. You, uh, so you cannot see part of the universe in de Sitter space. So it's similar to a black hole, only in the sense it has a horizon. That's all. But it's a horizon we are inside rather than outside. Okay? Equally paradoxical, in fact, more paradoxical. De Sitter space is, is this amazing uh, space-time. I mean, it's actually the simplest space-time in general relativity apart from Minkowski space. In many ways, it's simpler than Minkowski space because it has finite spatial sections. Um, I'll, I'll, do, I'll deal with it in a moment. You'll see. Yeah? You were saying before that there's only, you know, there's a quantum space-time film outside. Yes. But don't you have some, don't you have, like, stars that are really far away from us? Can you read out of horizon at some point? Yes, we do. So, so in fact... Uh, any galaxy which is not gravitationally bound to us, if we follow it forward in time, so it's receding from us now, and we go far enough forward in time, it's going to leave the horizon. 
and we'll never, it'll be the, like the astronaut falling on the black hole. It will go redder and redder and redder and disappear from view. So that's right. So my uh, claim is that as that happens, that galaxy is dissolving into space-time foam. It's obviously right. I mean, how could this be wrong? <laughs> yeah. why, why do you say we're inside that horizon? It seems very similar to a black hole horizon, which we are outside, because the, the light rays emitted from inside the black hole horizon will never reach us, and the light rays emitted from an observer far away will also never reach us. All right, you're forcing me to explain, <laughs> uh, which is good. Uh, I'll draw the space-time diagram. Okay, now, uh, the way to describe these causal the causal properties of space-time are Penrose diagrams. I haven't taught you those, but uh, uh, I'm just going to draw them. In uh, Penrose diagram, basically what you do is, say, for example, take Kruskal. You do a, a conformal transformation, which is a rescaling of the metric, to bring everything in to finite distance. But you leave light rays going at 45 degrees, as in Kruskal. And so Minkowski space looks like this. This is explained in Carroll, for example. Minkowski looks like this. Uh, that these are uh, plus infinity and minus infinity. Um, so when you do this transformation, so uh, the Penrose diagram of Minkowski space, I, I sit here. And, you know, I can send a light wave off to infinity. Or somebody in my past can send a, a light signal to me. Everybody is in communication. No. <laughs> no. It's a, there's a past infinity light cone which intersects with a future infinity light cone. Okay. So, uh, Kruskal is quite different. Kruskal looks like, um, uh, yeah, Kruskal looks like this. This is the singularity. This is the singularity. So this Penrose transformation has flattened that space-like singularity into a line and brought these infinities in. So this is kind of like... Uh, this is asymptotically like the Minkowski infinity, and then there's another Minkowski infinity out here, and the singularities inside the black and the white hole. Um, De Sitter, which is the solution of the Einstein equations with the only vacuum energy, um, looks like this. It's completely non-singular, okay, but it has a future space-like infinity. And this is a past infinity. And then my statement that uh, you can't see part of the universe means that if I'm sitting here and going up this line, all I can see is the stuff in half of the space-time. Right? There's a whole region here which I can never see. And this is the horizon, of course. This is the Horizon in um, Mi Minkowski space has no horizons. You can see everything. Um, the Kruskal Krus has uh, has two horizons, and De Sitter has uh, a horizon, a single horizon. And we live inside here, and all this other stuff. You know, so there's some galaxy going along here. As we discussed, it's going to leave our horizon, and then I won't. Um, you know, it'll sort of disappear in this red shifting away. So in the conventional cosmology book, you will hear the description as if all of this really exists, as if it's classical, it goes on forever, there's galaxies off to infinity. Uh, in my view, that's just inconsistent with the idea of a quantum theory. So, um, can't be right. Uh, and nobody... You know, there are all sorts of clues. As you know, Planck satellite is giving us some amazing clues. So I, I feel we're on the threshold of a new revolution in physics, and uh, it's going to be pretty exciting. 
Right, cosmology in 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to give you a little sketch, and hopefully I will show you the sitter space. By the way, our real universe is not the sitter space, it's the sitter space in the future, but as far as we know, there was a singularity in the past, which was space-like, so uh, we can't, so, so this, the real universe has a singularity. Has a singularity in the past. Okay, uh, let's discuss cosmology. I'll try and just give you a sketch. Now, you you you've done some of this, right, with uh, Matt Johnson? Did you you didn't do De Sitter? Pardon? We, we ah, good. Diagram for ah, very good. So, you didn't uh, you didn't do De Sitter. You didn't do De Sitter space. Okay. You see, the other thing about Minkowski space, there's no scale. In Kosovo space, there's no scale. So once you write it down, sort of the only natural scale is infinity. I mean, it's a whole thing. There's no scale in Minkowski space. But in the Sitter space, there's a scale set by the dark energy, the cosmological constant. And that's a very fundamental thing. And I, I believe that the only theories which really make sense are ones with uh, such a scale. And uh, that scale will define the... Uh, the length scale beyond which uh, uh, classical description breaks down. Okay, so uh, cosmology. Um, again, we're looking for solutions of the Einstein equations. And the guiding principle, so you're faced with these horrible nonlinear PDEs with... Uh, many uh, degrees of freedom, and nobody has the faintest clue what the general solution of Einstein equations look like. It's just too hard a problem. So imagine you're Einstein. You want to think about this problem, um, but it's too arbitrary. And at the time, he knew nothing about the universe. I mean, literally, uh, almost nothing. People thought there was only one galaxy in the universe until the mid-1920s. There was a fierce debate between Shapley and someone else. Can't remember. Fierce debate, is there more than one galaxy? Okay, so Einstein's working in 1915. He has no clue what lies beyond our galaxy. But he wants to study the whole universe, evolution of the universe, using general relativity. So what does he do? He assumes a symmetry. The universe is homogeneous and isotropic, okay, to a first approximation. So let's just assume the universe is the same everywhere in space. And it's the same in all directions, about every point in space. That's what homogeneous and isotropic means. And uh, this is usually, uh, uh, this forces the metric into a certain form. which is very intuitive. It's just the, the this is called the Friedman robertson walker metric. And basically what it says is that, so I'm not going to prove this, it's not hard to prove, but there is a coordinate system in which the metric takes this form.
Okay, so so the metric, uh, the existence of the symmetry ensures that there exist coordinates such that the, met the line element takes this uh, form. And uh, where k is a number, the curvature scale, the space curvature scale, or let's say the scale, let's say k equals 1 over length squared, where L is the scale of curvature. of space. Okay, so this homogene homogeneity and isotropy force the metric to take this form. K can be any number in this equation. The simplest case, if K is zero, in which this is just the flat space metric, okay, in spherical polar coordinates. Um, if K is positive, then space is a sphere of radius, so k greater than zero, then space is a sphere of radius uh, L. Uh, and actually, the proper radius is A of t times L, because this line element is multiplied by A of t, so that means that all distances are just scaled up with A of t. If k is negative, let's write it down this way. If k equals plus 1 over L squared, if k is minus 1 over L squared, then space is a, is a um, um, hi, um, hyperboloid hyperboloid, the sphere is S3, the hyperboloid is H3, that's a negatively curved space of constant negative curvature uh, of ra uh, um, yeah, radius, you can call it a radius, um, A of T, L. Okay, so you have this possibility of positive space curvature or negative space curvature or zero space curvature. And observations seem to indicate that the curvature of space is very nearly zero for reasons we don't, uh, don't understand. Uh, the curvature term in the, in the, yeah, the curvature term in the Einstein equation contributes uh, less than 1%. In fact, the theory, part of the motivation of the theory of inflation was to explain that number. But uh, as uh, in my view, it never really succeeded in explaining it. Okay, so we take that metric which is a very, very intuitive thing, right? You're just taking a metric, uh, which in the simplest case is just flat three-dimensional space. You're multiplying it by a squared of t. So as a changes, a is called a scale factor. It's just stretching the space. Okay, so this is a very intuitive picture of what space is doing as the universe evolves in time. So now we can work out the Einstein equations. Um, I need these formulae. So first, so we can work out the left-hand side of the Einstein equations. just by calculating uh, the Einstein tensor 
g0, 0. So this turns out to be 3 times a dot over a squared plus k over a squared. Uh, a dot over a is defined to be the expansion rate, which is also the Hubble parameter. Okay, it's often called the Hubble constant, uh, H, but that's a terrible name because it's not constant. <laughs> okay, A of t is a function of time, and A dot over A is a function of time, and so it's much better to call it the Hubble parameter. That's just the rate at which space is expanding. Okay, so if, uh, in particular, if H is constant, then the scale factor is growing exponentially. Okay, so a constant expansion rate means that the scale factor grows exponentially with time, and that is actually what's happening in the, in the universe today. That's this property of De Sitter space-time. So that's the zero, zero component, and just for completeness, um, will I, yes, uh, I will bother, so we can work out the spatial components of the Einstein tensor, and this turns out to be minus a dot squared plus 2a a double dot plus k times gamma ij, where uh, gamma ij dx i dx j is the spatial line element, and so that's the dr squared over 1 minus k r squared plus r squared d omega squared. Okay, so that's uh, the spatial part of the metric is a squared gamma i j. So i e g mu nu is equal to minus 1 in the tt direction. And then in these three components, it's a squared gamma ij. And it's zero everywhere else. OK, so that's the left-hand side of the Einstein equations. And now let's calculate the right-hand side. So the right-hand side, we just need um, the right-hand side of Einstein. We need to know t mu nu. So t mu nu is equal to, and we're going to assume perf a perfect fluid form. And let me write it down and, uh, and then justify why it's a perfect fluid. Uh, so T mu nu for a perfect fluid is uh, P plus rho u mu u nu plus P g mu nu. Now let's see, I can't remember. Have we done this in the course or not? No? Haven't done this. Okay, so uh, we've done a fluid of particles, right? Um, and so that's a sort of an attempt at a microscopic uh, description of what's going on in a fluid. But if you want to describe a fluid like water or air or a, a large collection of galaxies or dark matter or the vacuum energy, um, the, uh, a better description is to say that any fluid, I can sit in the fluid, and this is the local fall velocity of the fluid. Okay, so you take some little element of the fluid and you say it has a fall velocity. Any fluid has to have a density. So that's, um, that's the um, energy per unit volume. And uh, P is the pressure. Okay. Um, 
And then um, the equations of motion of the fluid, the equations of motion are just, just d mu t mu nu equals zero. Okay, so those equations of motion are enough to define what happens to the fluid, uh, how it evolves, but um, these, these uh, are enough to determine the motion of the fluid, the evolution of the fluid, of the fluid, given, very important, if you are given the equation of state, of state pressure as a function of the density. Uh, why are they enough? You see, if the pressure is a given function of the density, for example, in an ideal gas, um, pressure is, you know, when you do undergraduate physics, pressure is one-third nmv squared. The density is nm, so pressure is one-third um, one times, um, times the density times um, uh, v squared, and then one can determine v squared in terms of the temperature of the fluid, and so the pressure and density become relati related uh, in, a, in an ideal gas um, we have um, everything is a function is a function of temperature. Okay, so pressure and density would both be functions of temperature, and then you can express the pressure, the density, the pressure is a function of the density, and vice versa. So. It turns out that this is adequate to describe the, um, the background in the universe, the homogeneous isotropic component of the matter. Okay, so this is adequate to describe either the radiation or the dark matter or the dark energy or everything else. And all of those really just depend on this equation of state. They all have different equations of state. So examples radiation has pressure equal to one third rho, which is basically a consequence of that formula I mentioned. P equals one third nmv squared, but v squared for radiation is the speed of light. So that's one. And the one-third just comes from averaging the pressure, averaging the motion of the particles in different directions. Uh, cold dark matter, also known as dust. Yeah, I should say it's not the dust which biceps saw. <laughs> in, GR, in GR, there's a technical meaning to dust, which is just kind of particles that, don't, that follow geodesics and don't interact with each other. Uh, but in cosmology, we usually call it cold dark matter, just a collection of particles that don't interact with each other or light, uh, except through gravity. They only interact through gravity. And these ones uh, obey pressure equals zero. Then we have uh, dark energy. Now, dark energy is a special, special thing. Okay, that's the cosmological constant that is, in its elementary description, all it is, is I add to the matter action. Okay, so dark energy, I add, well, let's write it down first. So it's P equals minus rho. Why is that true? Uh, start off from the matter action. It's one over, I think I already told you this, integral d4x root minus g minus lambda. Okay, because it's a potential energy, so it's negative if lambda is positive. 
as seems to be the case in our universe. So just add a constant to the Lagrangian, and that's dark matter. And now when you work out T mu nu, you will get, um, you know, varying this guy, you're going to find lambda uh, g uh, minus lambda g mu nu, so that T naught naught, which is the energy density, is lambda in, in, uh, in these uh, coordinates, FRW coordinates. So you can see from here, if P is minus rho, this term is gone, okay? And um, the T mu nu is P G mu nu. And so this implies that P equals minus lambda and rho equals lambda. Okay, so lambda is strange stuff. It has negative pressure. Okay, you, maybe you thought pressure had to be positive. Well, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. A good way of thinking about that is negative pressure is really tension. You know, when I have a string or an elastic band and I pull its two ends and I say, what's the pressure exerted by the elastic band on, on, on the two points that are pulling it? Well, obviously negative, right? So, so an elastic band behaves like an object with negative pressure. And the dark energy or cosmological is the same kind of stuff. If you try to stretch space, it will try to collapse space. Okay, so at first sight you think it must be doing the opposite of what we say it does. We say it makes the universe blow up. Okay, but it has negative pressure, so how does that work? Well, it's a very peculiar thing, which I'll show you now. <laughs> um, so we're, I think we're done. I may... Uh, just write down the Friedman equation. Equation. So, this is an amazing history. Uh, Einstein did this first. He assumed the universe was static, because what else is he going to assume? <laughs> uh, Friedman was a young Russian uh, who was uh, uh, in uh, Leningrad at the time in the Mathematical Institute, and so he said, "No, let's make it. Let's allow the metric to depend on time," which, with hindsight, was uh, was an obvious thing to do. And uh, he discovered that the universe would expand or collapse. Um, and he told Einstein, and Einstein said, you must be wrong, makes no sense at all, <laughs> okay? But it was perfectly right. Unfortunately, Friedman then took a flight in a balloon to very high altitude and became sick shortly afterwards and died before the expanding universe was discovered. So uh, th there's an amazing history of all this. Um, Let's write down the Friedman equation. So the Friedman equation is just g naught naught equals 8 pi g t naught naught. Okay, so that reads a dot over a squared equals 8 pi g over 3. The 3 is from there. And then I have... Um, I'm going to write it the following way. Um, rho lambda. It's a density in lambda. That's a positive number, which is constant. That's equal to lambda. Okay, I'll call it rho lambda, just to emphasize it's a density. So that's a constant. Bingo, exponential expansion, okay? A dot over A is rho. Rho is constant. The universe expands exponentially. That's the sitter space for you. But in the real world, there's more than that. There's, there's Cm over A cubed. This is the density of matter. That's ordinary matter like we're made of. It's also cold dark matter. It goes like 1 over A cubed. Uh, then you have radiation, which goes like 1 over A to the fourth. And... 
uh, that'll do. There are other stuff. There's neutrino, which starts out like radiation and ends up like matter. But, uh, and then we have the minus k over a squared, where I just pull that term from the left-hand side and put it on the right-hand side. So this is the curvature term, the space curvature term. Now, uh, so we have this differential equation for A of t, the scale factor of A of t. And it's very easy to see what the general solution of that equation looks like. We just use our old trick of writing this as a kinetic energy minus a potential energy, right? So I write that as A dot squared minus 8 pi g over 3 rho lambda A squared. I'm multiplying through by A squared plus C matter over A, uh, plus C radiation over A squared, um, equals minus K. Kinetic energy, potential energy are constant. So in the Friedman equation, the role of space curvature is like an energy of this particle. If space curvature is negative, if we live in a hyperboloid, this looks like positive energy. Okay, so it's uh, clear the particle can kind of escape off to infinity. Let's just draw the potential and we'll see that. So this is V effective of A. V effective of A looks like this. Uh, minus A squared. Okay, so that is a term like this. That's the cosmological constant. This is V effective of A versus A. This is minus 1 over a, or minus 1 over a squared, so that looks like this. Okay? So we have a particle. Uh, k, minus k is the energy. So this level is minus k. If k is positive, what's the particle going to do? Well, I can have trajectories where it just, uh, just does that. Right? So it flies out from a equals 0, and it sails off to a equals infinity. It's basically, you know, like a ball rolling in this hill. And as it sails off to infinity, of course, the potential is becoming more and more negative, so it's going to expand exponentially. A of t will grow exponentially. This particle is just speeding up as it falls off the hill, and A of t grows exponentially. So that's for k negative. k equals zero is basically the same. That seems to be the universe we live in. It just uh, does this. Um, if the, if k is too positive, the universe would collapse, it, or uh, it could bounce. Okay, so this is recollapse or bounce, and uh, and of course a equals zero is the singularity when a equals zero. Okay, so that's the sort of uh, lightning overview of cosmology. Uh, are there any? Uh, I think I've showed you. Uh, uh, maybe I, I promised you the sitter space. The sitter, the sitter is just uh, rho equals rho lambda equals constant, and so a of t is equal to const some con or is uh, proportional to e to the h t, where h equals square root of 8 pi g over 3 rho lambda. And, the, and so the metric is just minus dt squared plus e to the 2 h t times dx squared. It's just a flat universe with the scale factor growing exponentially driven by the dark energy. Now, why on Earth, as I said, the dark energy has negative pressure. Why does it call exponential growth? And uh, that is because in the Einstein equations, it's not just the density that enters in the acceleration, it's also the pressure. The pressure is negative, and this negative pressure has a consequence of causing acceleration of expansion. It's just a strange feature of the Einstein equations.
Well, the, it's a bit of an illusion, to be, true, to be honest, because when you look at the global structure of De Sitter space, you find that what we've drawn here, this metric only covers half of it, okay? So this metric, here's our De Sitter space, this metric only covers half of it. There's another half of it which is contracting exponentially, okay? So when you have negative pressure, you have a part of space-time contracting exponentially and a part expanding exponentially. Um, the, um, yeah, I mean, um, if you want an intuitive picture, I think uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's difficult to give you one. Uh, the way I think about it is that to construct the sitter space, this negative pressure is repulsive. What I do is I throw the universe in at negative expansion, I mean, at a, in contraction, and the negative pressure repels it and it sails off to infinity again. Okay, but uh, it's a strange thing. And this leads to various consequences. In fact, the, you know, the fact, if you, normally you think if I had a bubble, imagine I had a bubble, some region with negative pressure. Your intuition would be that bubble would collapse, not expand. And in fact, that intuition is correct, <laughs> okay? So if I take a universe and I make a patch, which is negative pressure, the rest of it may continue to expand, but this negative pressure patch will collapse. It's only if I make the whole universe negative pressure that the whole universe ends up expanding. So it's sort of, uh, it's strange. We don't have good intuition for it. And there may be good reason for that. It may, may not really make much sense. Yeah, I mean, that's just a mathematical statement, that the Einstein equations imply that, uh, uh, yes, another way of saying it is that conservation of stress energy uh, looks like, so you can calculate um, d mu t mu nu equals zero, and it turns out this is just rho dot equals minus three a dot over a p plus rho. So if p is minus rho, then rho is a constant. As the universe expands, the density doesn't change. Now, that's kind of intuitive because you see, think about a string. Again, my example of negative pressure. The thing about a string is that as I um, stretch it, the um, uh, I'm, I'm doing work the expansion of the string is doing work on it, okay? So as, um, so an expanding string with negative pressure, necessarily the energy in the string's got to grow, right? So negative pressure plus expansion means growing energy. And that's what this equation means. You see, if P is minus rho, it's like my string has, has uh, um, that as space stretches, the rho remains constant. That's a funny thing about the cosmological constant. The space expands, it's the same, right? It's just a constant. <laughs> so you can double the size of space and you just have twice as much energy. And it's because of the negative pressure because the expansion is doing work against the negative pressure, right? So as the space expands and rho is constant, and then uh, as Vasudev said, if rho is constant, then somewhere here, we've got, if rho is constant, you get exponential growth. Okay. Any other questions? No? Well, you, you are rid of me. <laughs> if you ask me nicely, I might can come and give you some talks. <laughs> Yeah, let me just say it's been really, really fun teaching you, and uh, 
I, I think you're a, a fantastic group of students. Uh, and I'm not just saying that. I think the atmosphere is really exceptional this year. And uh, I just encourage you to have lots of fun and don't stress. OK? And I hope, I hope to see all of you uh, doing extremely well in the future. So, so thanks a lot.